Welcome creatives and good evening. So today, as already said before, we are going to have a wonderful speaker come to share his ideas, share his experiences and share the next step into creativity. As the theme for the meeting was already stated, we are going to share strategies that are going to explode your creativity. And this is a meeting where you can't miss, honestly. And it's a very, very, very big opportunity that you're having to be sitting under this meeting. So today's speaker is architect S.M. Korte. He is the president of the Ghana Institute of Architects. He's also the CEO and principal architect of the multi-award winning architecture firm, Atelier. He's also the principal architect that designed the Cal Bank head office. Now, I know you're as excited as I am. So I would like you all to give him your rapt attention. We'd like to welcome architect SM Korte. Thank you. Thank you very much, Papa, for that beautiful introduction. Um, creatives, I think it's a great honor to have this opportunity, this platform, to share with you on something that we all have in common. Um, a few weeks ago, when I had the pleasure of meeting Leslie and, and Lester and, Leslie and uh, Papa, I, I was actually very excited with the conversation on creativity. And then this topic came up. So I, I said to myself, okay, so to start to talk about creativity, I believe that we need to start talking about God. I believe that he created us all in his own image. And for each one of us, he gave us ability to also create. But for people like you and me, we are given more of the creative juices in us. Because some of you may be architects in the making, some of you may be artists, etc. Or some people, when you are lawyers and making, you have identified that you have a special knack for creativity. I try to ask myself this question, perhaps this question, as I say, what is creativity? I would say that it is um, the ability to use our imagination or something original to invent things or to come up with something of an original idea. I mean, this is um, really, so you are using something original or your imagination. And people like you and me have been born to such a um, special skill. It's an interesting one, but I said that it's not limited to the people of the arts alone. But for today's discussion, I realized that if you want to talk broadly about creativity, you may be getting into too wide a sphere. So we'll limit it to creativity concerning the physical things, the arts, the things that we see, not necessarily as in creativity in terms of let's say music or other professions like the sciences, etc., but more to do with buildings, the arts, and fashion, and things like that. That's what we'll limit today's discussion on creativity too. So as I mentioned earlier, all of us have been birthed with this kind of instinct and us for this kind of special talent. But it is to say we look around us and say, what can we do that people can call creative? The things that today you and I look at and say, wow, this is creative. People of old, one day still, they sat, they talked and they said, no, we need to do something about this. They came up with things that was groundbreaking, was unbelievable in their time. And today we look at that and we say, wow, this is creative. Um, I am particularly excited that this conversation is with young people because uh, to be creative, sometimes uh, it's your ability to challenge or question the status quo. And honestly, in life, as you grow older, you may start to accept so many things as if you can't do anything about them. And so it makes it even more difficult to be creative when you're growing older. But for young people, for um, late teen or early 20s or people like that, you, you are at that stage in life where you're looking again and you're questioning, why is this done this way? What can be done differently? And so it gives me a great opportunity to have this kind of conversation. Uh, I'll go on to say that um, all around us there are things that we've accepted as being normal. This is 
how we build. This is how we saw it. But to be creative is to say that, must it stay that way? Can we be better? In my little preparation before this conversation, I said to myself that today's creative person ought to understand technology. Because technology is the one thing that is different from yesterday. I mean, people of old questioned and said, must we continue to use carriages and horses to travel from one place to another? People came up with one creative thing, one engine, double engine, all of those kinds of things. And today we are sitting in what we call cars. And we find them beautiful. I looked to the future, I said, possibly another 10 years, 20 years from now, what we'll be having is we'll have cars that have an ability to even fly. And so somebody's going to say, well, I mean, insects can walk and they can fly. So maybe we should have cars too that can drive and fly when they are challenged. Uh, we're going to have all kinds of uh, things coming back. Most of it is going to be bordered on technology and the way we understand technology. I say that as well, to be creative today, we have to look to the challenges that we face. We're in a world where time, money, space, we are challenged by all of these things differently. And for each one of us, our ability to come out of these challenges is what we call creative. So sometimes you may have a space which is very limiting. The clients or you want to use the same space for an office, you want to use the same space for a home. How are you going to go about that kind of thing? If we're able to create a space that can be multiple used, it probably will be a, a call to creativity. Um, Michelle, can you show us something on, for example, if you're challenged with space and then you want to use the same space for multiple use, what are you going to be doing for that kind of thing? And so our ability to have, so it's the same space, it's very limiting, but we want to be able to have a bed there when it's night to sleep. We want to be able to use the same space for a living room or an office during the day. I mean, people in times past possibly look at the fact that one time you want to use a space or material for a chair, then later you want to lie down on the same thing. So now something came up that we call now super bed or something. So at one point it's just so far you sit on it, another point you stretch it for you to have it. So creativity is also the ability to create that kind of flexibility of things that otherwise would have been very rigid use or multiple use of spaces and materials. Creativity is going to call on you to use material differently. In fact, what people would have seen as wastage, you'd have to find a way to use uh, um, things which could otherwise have been waste for, for better usage. So, um, so the things we look around us like sometimes uh, we're calling them recycling, things that we would have thrown them away, we would have trashed them. We have to find ways to say that we can put them to better uses. So you look around you, the things that people are throwing away. I've particularly been uh, conscious about something like coconut and coconut husk. We see them all around us everywhere we go, and it seems like it's ready to be trashed. That, can it not be put to better use? I know that sometimes people have used them for dormants, but even the coconut shell itself what could be used for. This is the call to all of us creatives. So what can we use it for? Sometimes I've seen uh, fish scales, very interesting colors and very hardy. It doesn't easily decay, but it's often just thrown into the rubbish bin and, and, and discarded or sent to the uh, uh, incinerator. Could we think of more use of these materials. So when we're talking creativity, we're talking about a zero wastage or the things that others want to discard. Our ability to put them to better use. Today's generation is looking at tactic clothing in a way that previous generation never looked at it. Things that are worn out, they are trendy. I want us to all start to look at all of these things again. So for me, at the end of this evening's conversation, if I have many of you we're looking at this whole subject around us, everything we see, and what can we put it to, what good use can we put it to. I'll say that we are truly becoming creative. I said to um, Leslie and Cole that every day we look to the ceilings in all the spaces that we're in. Perhaps as I start this conversation, we can look to the room that you are in. We see white ceiling. Every ceiling is white. Must every ceiling be white? Who has? Uh, make that uh, a, a law. It does not have to be. Perhaps we can find ways to create more excitement from our cities than white. 
I mean, it's possible that by use of technology, you can have some kind of a gadget that when you press it, the ceiling in your room changes color. So it can actually begin to look like a bright sky, it can look like a cloudy sky, it can look like a, a night sky. Because truly, when you're in a room, your ceiling is like a sky on the outside. So you must think in this dimension. We see block tiles everywhere we go. Uh, as God created um, the earth, the grounds that we walk on is not as fine as tiles and things like that. Sometimes it's like sand. Can we have the material that we have in our rooms that looks like sand, but does not have the mess of sand we are being created? Uh, perhaps walls and things, instead of us going to the extent of creating colors and materials on walls, maybe a wall can be a blank color. And whatever you desire, the kind of mood that you have can change the world to that by like way of technology. So again, this is uh, us using technology uh, to be creative. I, I think um, I saw a friend who one day was wearing some clothing and he was wearing different pairs of shoes. And when I looked at it, I just said, wow, that's interesting. Then again, I asked myself, well, who says that we must always wear the same pair? You know, so it could be different. This is being creative. I mean, let's be careful though. Sometimes when you are a bit too much on some of these things, you can actually begin to look a bit of a comic. So I don't want us to necessarily say we go out of line completely. But um, for many years, every door in every house was 2.1 tiles. Must it be so? Can the door be 2.4? Can it be 3 tiles? This is creativity. It's a bit like breaking away from the norm, the way everybody else thinks. We can do it better and differently with a certain touch of original into to it. That is being creative. Your clothing, the way you wear your hair, the furniture in your, in your house. I mean, recently I'm seeing that people are using uh, things that we call them what, uh, palettes for um, better use than what we used to just use them for, for packaging. It's interesting that is being creative. So let's all look up around us and what ways can we increase that. I found it very profound that in areas like medicine, etc. Now, there are many um, surgical activities that are done by laser, not by using scalpels and things to cut and things that in agriculture, people are now doing huge production of um, food products without going on to acres of land. They are doing them like greenhouse farming. That is being created here. Then supplying to greenhouse a year round supply of whether it is tomatoes or whatever you call it. We are not using 10 acres and 10 hectares and all of this is being created. Though, like you and me in the arts, in what ways can we also be creative? You know, and must every creative thing be expensive? Uh, it does not have to be. I mean, we are seeing that anytime we see a building that we say is beautiful, it is expensive. Must it be so? And um, we are seeing now that people who be in automobiles are able to produce cars that are very beautiful, but not so expensive. I mean, so you can see, I don't want to mention brands, I don't want to say that I'm looking down on any kind of brand, but they're doing that. I mean, so um, just the same way as um, these people are doing, even in fashion, we're finding beautiful jewelry that costs nothing because they call them cosmetic jewelry. But they look very beautiful. If you don't touch it, if somebody does not tell you that this is not genuine gold or diamond, you actually think it is gold or diamond, it costs nothing. So, people like us in the arts, in the building industry, we should be able to create things that don't necessarily cost so much, but looks really nice and glam. This is the call to creativity. We need to think, we need to look around us. I believe that when God created the world as well, He meant that. Um, each one of us should be able to use the materials in our locality to create whether it is shelter or clothing or whatever. So you see that um, people in certain areas will use animal skins or clothing. People may use whether it's coconut farm or farm, or coconut farm uh, branches or farm branches for their roofing because those are the materials they find available. So to be creative is also to be more aware of the materials locally available and to be able to put these materials to good use. We're at a time where we're looking for identity as Ghanaians. I tell people that the Ghanaian story hasn't yet been written. It hasn't yet been told. All about the world, I mean, people are coming to Africa and Ghana 
and we need to start to show them what we have locally available and what we can put them, the uses that we can put them to. Very soon, if we are able to take up this charge, some of these materials and some of this creativity will become another avenue for export, etc. So it's a wake up call for all of us. Uh, I said to the leaders of this group that what I want to do is to start to make my presentation on this subject. And as I do so, I want to see it as a teaser that uh, we get questions and we get also other contributions. Uh, creativity does not rest in one person's head. I may be more experienced in architects than most of you will be, but I, I believe that creativity is some kind of um, a different ballgame completely. Some of you can come up with certain creative things that I would marvel at. And so in this discussion, I'm hoping that I'm also going to be learning from you. So this will be my opening. And I welcome comments and questions and let the discussion work. Thank you once again, organizers, for giving me this opportunity. So let's have some more open discussions. So the first question is in, and it says, please, I want to ask, if I copy a design and add stuff to it, am I being creative? Okay, so um, the, the variables are not too clear here as to the extent to which you copy a design, but um, I mean, inevitably, we all copy a design in one hand. I'm not the first person to create a helical space. You know, somebody did it some time ago and I used a helicopter. there. Or I'm not the first person that created, let's say, a gable roofing or, uh, or, or cubism architecture. So um, to some extent, we all pick um, a little bits from things and then we add our personal touch to it. I like the part when he says that and I add stuff to it. I think that uh, adding stuff to it is making it yours. And I think that I encourage that. If you said, if the question was, if I took like detail to somebody's design, I would say that um, I, I, I expect creatives to do better. But when you say you add stuff to it, yes, it's, it's, it's kind of putting in your personal flavor to whatever you may have seen. And by, it's a very large extent. And I think that that is what most of our works will be. There are things that we've seen here and there, and then we add our own personal touch to it. So I, I think you're doing great. I just you're doing what it Okay, so the next question says, please, I want to ask, does creativity demand that you solely depend on your ability to create or you can learn from elsewhere and add it to your own? Um, both of them. Both of them. I, I think that we must strive to be original as much as possible. But uh, for me, um, the ability to take stuff and then add on to it or put on your personal flavor to it is creative. I mean, um, to a very large extent, there are a lot of things that you find that you cannot completely create your own original versions of it. So, I mean, um, you may have seen how somebody has done a, a living room or a kitchen and you may like it and then you may add a little bit of your own personal touch to it. So really this is very much like the first question, but um, I, I think today's discussion, I want to just encourage creatives to understand that um, in each one of us, there's an ability to actually bring some originality or even what you've seen someone else do, you can give it your own twist. To be creative is to have identity. Uh, the opposite is, is, is something that I call non descript You know, sometimes uh, you do a building and then, or you do a project and then you're trying to show somebody and there's nothing so unique to say that this is yours. Or maybe if you're not even available there, do people identify some of your work and say, I think this must be 
um, Charlotte's work or, or uh, um, Lucas' work. That is being created. It's almost like a signature. People ought to be able to see your works and say, this is your work. So it may be that you took something that somebody originally did or you seen, but then you add your personality to it in a way that you begin to own it. That is very important. Wonderful, wonderful. One person, Joel Mensa, is asking, most of the time, certain creative ideas are considered crazy at the time. It's, it is conceived, okay. Some turn out to be great ideas, others not so great. So what is the line between being creative and being reward with creativity? <laughs> okay, so I, I think that um, in, in, at the end, um, time usually becomes our true judge. And um, so you may create something today and um, with time and with usage, it will truly be tested. Now, if uh, it's tested and found to be not so useful or it's found to be wasteful, then it will be deemed to have been um, a crazy idea and not something that, but if it's found to be uh, of great usage and used to mankind, people would actually uh, call you an inventor. So, um, usually time and people at least usage is what truly will test the things that we do. I admit that there have been things that people may have dreamt about or spoken about years ago and their generation then would not have found much use to it. I believe uh, maybe centuries ago if somebody spoke of a means of transportation that you fly like a bear, it was a uh, look at this dream man's face. How can you fly like a bird? You know, yeah. Human beings can do, but today you know how the uh, aircraft is and things like that. So sometimes, yes, you could be creative, and the things you could talk about may be too way ahead of your time that the generation may actually think it's useful. It's for example, I've been making this conversation in my office about um, this thing I call, I said, they probably we call pregnant fast. So, <laughs> and then they, they laugh, and I said that maybe one day people would question, why must people be nine months pregnant? It's a lot of time. So maybe a drug will come, just like we have fertilizer that makes plants, um, we harvest them pick up. So maybe a drug will come that uh, women will take, and then in, in four months or something, they can have the baby. And for now, when you mention these things, people say, ah, this is such a joke, it's so funny. But it may be 50 years on, yeah, it will be a reality. So, yes, um, you may be creative and maybe you're, you're way ahead of your time. So, you may be deemed to be uh, crazy and comical, but if you will pass it your time, it will come of you and people will say that you're a visionary. Right. Okay, so the next question is from one gentleman. He says, please, what advice will you give to individuals who want to enter into real estate industry as an architect or a developer? Hmm. <laughs> okay. Um, I, I'd say that I, I like architects to go into these areas. I find them um, much better prepared for it than regular businessmen because they, they understand that. Um, is primarily is providing buildings for people's usage. But um, I, I usually tell people who are professional architects that when you're going into real estate, you need to remember that it's a business that you're going into. That um, it's not housing being done for personal usage. That a lot of times your end user is not known yet. So you need to be provide spaces that can be adaptable by many people. So it's not actually customized as if it's for personal usage. I also tell people that when you want to go into real estate as an architect, you need to remember that everything that you do is going to be replicated hundreds of times, sometimes a thousand times. So if let's say your building ought to be a certain square I remember I, um, I probably will not mention the clients, but many years ago, I was doing designs for them. It was the leading real estate developer in Ghana. 
and they are asked that I do three bedroom apartments to 150 square meters each. And when I came up, it became 158 square meters. And the day I went to meet the board to the presentation, they said to me, we support a eight square meters extra on each apartment. If we do 20 apartments, that is 160 square meters. That is an extra apartment that we could have done to make money, but it's because you have not been uh, in uh, what they call it, productive space. You are letting us build these things at more interest. So that's just eight square meters. Say, so it's no eight times 20 is 160. So we're doing 24 apartments. So go and bring it down to 150. So I'll say to an actor who wants to go into real estate that um, because of the numbers, um, in real estate, you're going to build designs several times, multiple times. So any mistake that you make is going to repeat it so many times. And uh, a lot of architects don't often tend to be best real estate developers. They are looking at the whole thing about the beauty of the building in Canada. Uh, one real estate mogul said to me that a successful real estate project is one that looks much better than it truly costs the, the developer. So your target is to create something that it looks so good, but it didn't actually cost you so much to build it. That is where you make money. If you build a building that is looking as expensive as you truly did it, it means that the margins on it is very little. So it's an interesting area. Uh, I say that the Ghanaian real estate uh, industry needs to be sanitized. I'll encourage architects to go into it, but you must remember some of these things so that you will be successful in what you can do. Thank you. So one person from our page asked a question, Janet, pardon me if I didn't mention your name, right? Would you say creativity is inherent or everyone can actually learn to be creative? Ooh. <laughs> It is has some questions. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, I I want to say that it's I want to believe that it's inherent. I want to believe that it's inherent. Um, but like many other um, things in life, some two could come into it by association. So sometimes there are people who may not necessarily at birth or at any ages identify that they were creative, but by association, they would actually be seeing things done in certain ways, which will trigger um, hitherto unknown creative juices in them. But um, many people are found to be um, amazingly creative. They cannot explain where they got it from. It's as if they were birthed with it. Right, so I, I would, I'm of the opinion that by far it's inherent, it's, it's an effect with it. And then as you go though, you could sharpen these skills and you could become so much more creative a person. But also some people would not at very early stages in life have identified themselves as being creative. But if they were to be so affiliated with creative people, they could learn of them and uh, tomorrow um, generations may probably describe them as well as creative but it's definitely a skill that is formed it is a talent that is developed um, with the right exposure and this is what makes this conversation to be very interesting many of you have these gifts many of you have this inherent skill in you but it's about how you're going to continue to hold it to sharpen it it's going to make people around you identify you more as a creative person. Uh, uh, one of the phrases that I say to people is that for the creative person, your eye is like a camera. Be observant. Every time, everywhere you're going, you look at things and it's as if you're taking pictures. And tomorrow, these are the things that is going to help you to create even better. Uh, I say when you're watching movies with your friends and they're laughing about the storyline, they're laughing and looking. They're looking at how did they create that little room? Look at the parking area. How did they do it? How did they... So your eye almost is like blanking. Each time it's looking, it's like it's taking pictures. 
and this is going to sharpen your creative instinct. And we, you need to continue to push the limits. You need to continue to say, what can be done? I mean, we must everything be the same way it is. Years ago, when I finished school as an architect, I said, so how am I going to be known? How are people going to know me? I mean, nobody knew me. How are people going to identify my schools? And the more I asked these questions, answers came to me. One of the things I said was, I looked as if every building is a gable roof or a pitch roof or what, what they call. So I started to say, what can I do differently? Perhaps if I created roofs here, people would notice. People would say, okay, this must be a sense project. So I started to ask, how can I create care proofs? I started to talk to builders and things like some people showed me different things. I was looking, one of the things to identify was that every building was probably just an off-white or white building. So what can I do different? I said, well, I'll paint a building red and see, I'll paint orange. So I tried to do buildings that I gave them very unusual colors. I remember one time I did a project that I did a black color to a huge wall. And then it was like, each one of the buildings was black on a wall. And then once it was done against the white, I said, wow, that is different. So I started to question this. Every building I saw when I was growing up was kind of a rectangular or square. So I said, can I care the walls? Can I care things? So I said to do a few care but then before I knew, even when other people have done care design, everybody said it must be a central design. So listen, it's a call to all of us. It's a creativity must be in you. It is in you. That's why you are this platform today. That's why you're part of this university. But you ought to hone it. You ought to sharpen it. You ought to ask questions and desire to do things differently. Then you will be distinct and people will actually identify your work and say, you are a creative person. If you stay the way of your talent and your gifts, you're not going to go anywhere and your work is not going to stand out. And people are not going to know you as a creative person. Yeah. Wonderful. Wonderful said. One other lady, Priscilla, she's asking, are there any relations between arts and creativity? Are there are they dependent on each other or they are different? They are different things altogether. Well, I, I would say that I mean um, it is it is actually very completely related, but it is the delivery of it. So you could look at a work of art and then you could say it's creative. So if we say art, I mean um, buildings are buildings are artworks or paintings or sculptures, they are artworks. But you can see a certain sculptures and you will say that this is extremely creative. I think that we had the staircase thing that we're going to have shared. That looks. Right. So, I mean, this is sculpture, it's a staircase, and the way it's been done and created, you would actually say, oh, this is creative. But you can have also some staircase that it's a staircase and it's art. But you will not say it's creative. So let's remember to 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 um, to tap a certain word as creative. It must have some kind of originality. It must have some kind of uniqueness about it. It must actually cause people to say, "How did you do it? How did he? Uh, how how was it done?" And then we then put that tap creative on it. So art can be creative, but it can also have a lot of art. Or architecture that you would say is not creative, but to call it creative, a certain sense of originality about it, a certain sense of wow and deeper thinking than ordinary, then you would call it creative. I don't know whether that, that answers. Yes, it does. One another wonderful gentleman, Jordan, asks, "How do I deal with the discouraging remarks from tutors and advisors?" Okay, Jordan, so I, I want to say that we've been there before. Um, there's a rap that I I, I put in my uh, the book some years ago. I said that um, to avoid criti criticism, do nothing, say nothing, and you will be nothing. So, once you're in school, your lecturers are going to criticize. Now, the thing with the profession that we're in, the arts, the creative, is that to a very large extent, 
it is very subjective. And I've been so shocked sometimes when I've met clients who, I mean, this person could be so rich and so well-traveled. And then they'll show me something, so I like this thing. And I look at me and say, in my head, I'm asking myself, what the hell do you like about this? There's nothing beautiful about this. So listen, Donna, in school, your lecturers may not like the things you do. They may think differently about it. I keep telling students that you need to pass. You need to graduate. So if this is what your lecturers particularly want you to do, I say that do it. Get through school. When you get through school, they are not the ones to judge you. There are many people who are doing so well in practice today who are not necessarily best, best in the eyes of their lecturers in school. But the world has different standards of judging. But truly, in your school, you want to stick to what you think is nice and you want to do. Um, unfortunately, you will crash with your lectures and you may not get through successfully. But um, generally in life, though, I do not want to, um, to, to lie to you about discouraging remarks and not everybody being on the same page as you. As a person, one of the things I've told myself is that when people criticize me, yes, initially I get demoralized, I'm human. But sometimes I go back, I sleep over it and I say, what if what he's saying is right? What if it's not so nice as I thought it was nice? And sometimes I've kind of come back the next day and created something better. And later I've looked at it and truly, sometimes it may be true that what you did first which you thought was nice, maybe it could be improved. So we must be people who take up criticisms, not as if it's the end of our lives, but we must let it cause us to, to do better. Truly, there are certain people too who are just cynical critics, and whatever you do, you don't find it pleasing. We can't please them all. We can only keep trying and doing our best. Okay. One question from Penel is asking, who should you discuss your ideas with? And how protective or open should your ideas, should you be about your ideas? Okay, I'll take it again. So from Penel, who should you discuss your ideas with? And how protective and open should you be about your ideas? Okay, so, um, I, I'm of the opinion that we should be um, quite protective about ideas from certain people. I mean, there are times when actually what you're working on, you are easily in competition with others about. I don't think it is wise to be discussing in that context your ideas with everybody. It's not a wise thing to do. But um, there are other times that it's not so. And you must be free to bring out your ideas. Listen, the, the works that you and I would do, if it only was to stay on our computers and things like that, then we are, we are going nowhere with them. And one day it's going to be built anyway, or it's going to be, whether it is a, a clothing design, whether it is a, a furniture design, it's going to be constructed, whether it's a building, and everybody's going to see it anyway. But uh, maybe when it's in the nascent stage, it's when it's not before then you must be a little protective about it and not necessarily discuss it with everybody. People do steal ideas, too. And it can be a very sad thing when, especially if you are in school and then there's work that you have to do and you have something very great and then you go and show it to them. And then the next day you go, everybody has um, copied it as well. It gives you more originality to your own. So sometimes we must be a bit protective. But I'm very liberal. I think of the opinion that um, what I do and how I do it is so unique that even if I discuss it with somebody, I still will be able to give it my own personal flavor. So I'm not often very uh, protective of my ideas. I talk freely to people. I like to share with people. And sometimes I found that in that environment, I've learned more from people than people think they are actually even learning from. Okay. And from Priscilla, we see a question here. 
in a situation where you don't have the required resources to implement what you want to create, what should you do? Yeah. It's, just, it's something that um, we call appropriate technology. It's almost like making use of what you have available. Um, the, the arts and creative people must not create a vacuum. When I say in vacuum, must not create things that can only remain an illusion that cannot be realized. So when you are creating things, you must be sensitive to what is available or how it can be implemented. Perhaps one big difference between architecture and um, other arts is that other arts, the products that you do is the end to itself. So let's say if I was a sculptor, if I did a sculpture piece, that is it. If I was a painter, if I painted something on a canvas and I hand it, that is the end of it. But as an architect, what I draw, the three dimensions, the models that I create, it's not the end of it. It is now to be built. It is now to be realized. So uh, let's touch this thing again. We are talking to creatives here. Some of you may be artists, some of you may be designers or whatever, and things like that. Um, if you are, let's say, a furniture designer, if you are a hairstylist, if you are a clothing person, what you draw or what you design is not end of it. It has to be now implemented. So if what you've done does not, to implement it, it does not have the materials to achieve it, you will be described as a dreamer. If I do a design of architecture in such a manner, and I say I want a glass that is from here all the way to that with no joints, and there's nothing like that, I'm not being real. Our work is not to be admired on this picturesque the basis of just as a picture. It's admired in, in, in use when it's implemented, when it's built. So please, um, when we are dreaming, let's dream recognizing the limitation in resources that we have so that whatever we do, it can actually be implemented. But like I said, if your work is just, let's say, an art, it's just a picture, it's a painting, then what you do is an end to itself. It's not as if it has to be, right? So there's a major difference in in the arts for some of us on this platform in the discussion. I'm particularly very concerned as an architect too about what can be built. For me, there's no purpose in creating all this beautiful thing if it cannot be built. And uh, we are so limited in our country here by available materials, by craftsmen, skills, etc. And we must have this sensitivity whenever so that um, whatever we do can I mentioned at the beginning, uh, the name is Priscilla, right? Yes. And if you, if Priscilla, if you're on the platform, I was saying this thing that um, God, in His unknowing nature, when He creates you in Iceland, He expects that when you're going to build your house in Iceland, your know, igloos, etc., you're using the ice, you're using the snow, you're using all of that to create. And there's stone and things that you create. If he, if he is to create you in the Amazons or whatever, and Brazil, he knows there's a forest area with trees and logs and things that, and these things you are going to use to create your houses and things that. If God creates a fish, he gives a fish gills and fins and all that, that the fish can survive in water. If God creates a snake, he gives a snake the kind of spine that it can move. Blah, blah, blah. So I believe that for each one of us, for where God has created us, there are materials that we can use for the work that we do, for the houses that we are going to live in the building. So you need to be so aware of what is available when you are creating, that you don't create things that are not available. Then our work will be just uh, incomplete. Yes, please. So there's a question from Godwin Namasi. He is asking, how can creativity change my life? Hmm. But if you are creative, and I believe everybody on this platform today is a creative person. Um, today we are saying to you that uh, creativity is about your imagination and original ideas to create. Um, 
for me, regardless of whatever the profession that you are in, if you're a creative person, maybe right in your own personal space, your bedroom, where's the position of your bed? Where's the position of your, your wardrobe? Where's your, and you can, you can let creativity change your world. What, how do you wear your clothing? How do you wear your hair? What kind of, it's, it's all creativity as we are discussing. And so what we are saying from today is that everything we do around us, we must question it, we must not do, oh, this is how everybody does it. Actually, ask, is this what I want to do as well? Or can I do it differently? So um, creativity in that sense can change your life in so many ways. So you see people, I, I meet people, I look at them and then I just go like, this person is a creative person. It's probably one way a person wears their clothing or their hair or their jewelry. You can just tell they are creative people. You walk into somebody's house. It could be even somebody who's not an architect. It could be a doctor. Could be, but you can just see, oh my, this person is creative. You can way they put the carpets. You can really put the furniture and all of those kinds of things. So everything that we have around us, let's begin to look at it again. Even when you see a creative person's car, sometimes in the interior, you may see that it's we suit differently and things are so everywhere we have an opportunity to put a touch of creativity. So, so if you want to change your life, um, I think that more or less like look again everywhere around and see what can you do differently, colors and things like that. Yes, please. So one person is asking, are there outstanding principles which cannot be avoided practically in the quest of be, or in the quest to become creative? If yes. Can you highlight a few? Okay, so I I want to just, I, I wish I could put this properly, maybe I'll think about it, but to be creative, we must, we must respect, we must respect today, we must respect yesterday. So it's, it's our ability to, or it's our ability to understand what informed the things we see today. Our, our willingness to make a certain input today for tomorrow's people. So I want to say that uh, like earlier on in a discussion I had with some of you before this conversation, I said that I could decide to be creative and let's say instead of my rectangular windows there, make it circular. And as a window, it's meant to bring in light, it's meant to bring in ventilation. So it serves the purpose. But let's take that I'm looking at the doorway which a human being has to walk through. If I decide that I want to be creative, so I turn the door, so that instead of the door standing this way, it seems like it's something flat. So now everybody, when you are coming into my office, you have to squat and go down. That is disrespecting the uh, forefathers and things who in their wisdom recognize that as human beings we walk. So we have a little bit of width, but more height. So doors are 900 by less than 2.1 to be created. So, so um, to be creative is not to disrespect what has been done before us, but it's to understand why that came into being. And okay, could it be that it has a challenge and we can add something to it or make some change that makes it function even better. So. People who, who disrespect today or disrespect what our forefathers have done, sometimes in their bids to be creative, can actually come up with things that becomes not so practical. So, I mean, that would be my, my response to this question. That, yeah, so there are certain things we need to, is, I don't know whether it's to say principles, but there are certain things it ought to be so. I mean, if you are climbing staircase, uh, um, have a certain riser and a certain thread. It's been tested over time and that's what it is. If you decide to do it another way, it can make climbing the stairs a very uncomfortable experience. And if you say that you are doing that in the name of creativity, nobody is going to embrace this creativity. So there are things around that that we need to be respectful of them and accept them as it is. And then there are things that we can actually see that Maybe we can bring in a bit of creativity and do them differently. We need to be able to have the wisdom to see the differences and go for it. Yes, please. Now, there's an, a very amusing 
question here from Precious. She's asking, do you still have any of your, do you have any of your school products with you? How do you feel when you see them? <laughs> okay, I haven't cited my school for, uh, products in a while, but I remember many years ago, I went to Kenya City for a lecture, and then one of my lectures was discussing some work that I did. And I remember the work, and then I, 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 I laughed, but it was more of to say that, Ooh, did I really do that? I wasn't feeling all proud about it. I know there's a building as well that I did in my very early years at the school. It was at uh, Suman, and I hadn't seen it in a long while. One day, I was driving past it, and so immediately my eye fell on it. So I got the building, and I turned away really get because I was kind of ashamed about it, that did I do that? So, uh, we've come a long way. Um, not everything I did way back then, but I feel that it was done so right. And if I had a chance today, I'm sure that would have done them very differently. But that, I think, is a positive thing to be thinking that each day, each year, what I'm doing is better than yesterday. It gives me the feeling that I am improving as a person and not uh, past the best of my times. So we have a question here. It says, I have come to realize that creatives who don't share appear not to be creative at all or probably do not come up with anything extraordinary. Why is it so? I think it's a, it's a very big principle. Sometimes it's like people who gives to receive more. So um, I, that's how I look at it. I have found it that sometimes in sharing, in discussing my ideas, if even it's not to say that the other person gives me directly any feedback, I found out that in talking about it, my thoughts get even better formed. So I'm of the school of thoughts that uh, as a creative person, I must share, I must discuss my thoughts. And I want to encourage all of us to be that open. And one of the things we criticize about our society, not just by creative people, is that we don't publish our works. We don't talk about our works. I think that it must change. I mean, in other civilizations or in other countries, People write, people publish, and they are aware that people can steal from it, but they do so still. So they definitely seem to be more positive in sharing your work than in hiding your work or refusing to show it to anybody. Besides, though, as I mentioned, as pretty people, really your work is going to see daylight for you to see the way out of So if you hide it just on your computer, then really what acknowledgement are you going to get? Yes, please. So, okay, before then, before I continue with the questions, quick reminder, so you can still be sending your questions in. They are being addressed. <laughs> we'll soon have a quick break, though. But for now, let's have a quick break. For now, let's have a quick break so that I can prepare your, prepare your questions and your suggestions as well. We are really open on for suggestions. Thank you very much. Okay, so we are back and we have received quite a number of questions actually. So the next question, how do I overcome imposter syndrome whereby you think you are, whereby you think your works are not good enough, but others say they are? Wow, this is very interesting. So who, who came up with this one? The name is actually not there. Okay. So I find it interesting. I, I think that... Um, I'm happy for your situation. I'll be very alarmed with the reverse. The reverse where you think that your work is very good and then others think that it's not good. Then you're actually not likely to get better because you think you are so good. But your situation where you don't even think your work is good, but it seems to be celebrated or to be applauded by others. I, I think that um, I've been I've been a bit yeah, I've seen that kind of thing before where I meet people and then they think that what I'm doing is so good, but I think that's really it's, it's kind of um, nothing so outstanding. I think it's a good thing. Uh, perhaps you need to be a little less, less harsh 
for yourself. You need to start believing that. And truly, people think that it's good. Maybe it's that good. Because um, in, in the arts, confidence is the key part. The more you believe that you're actually that good, um, you will be that good. Because uh, people, there's a, there's a phrase that I use, people will call you by the name you call yourself. So if you say to yourself that I'm the best architect, I'm the best designer, people will also begin to call you by that name. So um, do are cautioning over confidence, but really the people are saying, that your work is that good. Um, please believe yourself. But I think that stop being too hard on yourself. Believe it. The work that we do, it is for the consumption of people. So if people think it's good, I think you are aware. Many people are struggling to get others to believe in their work. If people are believing in their work, um, start believing as well. That could be. Yes, please, sir. So we have one question from. Rainy, sorry again if I can pronounce your name right. How do I deal with the fear of not achieving or attaining ideas when designing? The question is a bit ambiguous. Okay, let me let me say it again. How do I deal with the fear of not achieving or attaining designs ideas when designing? So like maybe um she is designing and maybe midway. The, there's a fear that how do I develop the design, like the ideas to improve on it? How, how does she deal with that fear mm. of maybe going blunt? Okay. okay. Well, unfortunately, I've, I've almost understood all of the others. It's really the fear that I beg you to rephrase your um, question and let me answer it properly for you. I, I'm getting the idea that um, there's a certain fear that you have. I'm just unable to understand what that fear is so that I'll be able to provide you the right answer. So if you're hearing us, if you can please rephrase your question so that I can answer it again. But if you don't mind, if you could do the next one. Yes, please. So there is a question from Anita. She's asking, can one be termed creative when he builds up one Okay, when when builds up on people's work of art, what is the difference between being creative and innovative? And um, I think this was addressed in a different question, but maybe if you could kindly touch on it. So I am I'm, I'm not against. Um, I, I do not think that creativity basically um, restricts you to originality or authorship completely. So I believe that uh, bits of ideas from here and there. When you build on it, uh, when you add your personal touch to it, it will still be termed as creative. Um, yes, in innovativeness, it's, uh, it's still, it's, it's still, a, it's a, it's still a synonym for creativity. I mean, to be innovative is um, to find a way that you, 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 you create the situation which others would have found um, challenging. Or, so it's a challenging situation, but you come up with a solution that people will find unique or will find amazing that you found such a solution to it. And innovativeness possibly then defines more originality than creativity may define. So to be innovative is actually being original in a challenging situation, you know, to, to be able to find a solution in a challenging situation. I I think this person is coming up too frequently. Uh, my personal view, and I do not want it to sound like that as what well, it is, is that I think that um, I go with this thing that there's nothing new under the sun. That there are a lot of things that we do, we may have seen some idea, some thoughts, and then maybe we give a different twist. So I may have seen uh, somebody using some material on the floor, and I thought it was nice, and I have an opportunity to design, and I use a similar material on the wall. You know, so it's somebody I didn't see it used on the wall, but I use it right. I, there's a column that I, I designed, for example. I was one day I thought that I was getting an inspiration from when I'm looking at beats and the way beats are. I thought that um, you could find a way that you string iron rods, the way um, like there are strings that goes through the beats, the balls, and things like that. So, I put together something that looks like a circular thing 
Don't that looks like Tandra, but all of these have holes in it. And the iron rods as reinforcement goes to started in my home and a couple of projects like that. And but then the original idea, I looked at it and how it is like. So is it to say that I've copied something? So things that we see around us, sometimes they could be nature elements. People have looked at, let's say, the um what they call the um is a bird that is um it, it has a huge top and a very lean legs and then the feet is kind of work. This one is the it, it, okay, it's like the stock or something. But it's flamingos are like that. Okay. So the top is very heavy. And then they have very lean legs. But then the legs uh, the feet itself is kind of worked. Mm-hmm. Okay. People have looked at that and used it to design tall buildings. Mm-hmm. So the tall building is then and this foundation is like the work of this flamingo, for example. Okay. Um, they looked at nature and it inspired them to do a certain design. So I think that uh, the point for us to understand a creative person may look at your hairstyle and think that it can come up with a roof that looks like that. Okay, but it was inspired from looking at somebody's hairstyle. So we all see things around us that we put a personal twist to it. I don't think that that questions the originality or says that you are not a creative person. So Clinton is asking a personal question to you. He's asking, do you have a design style or a philosophy you adhere to? Okay, so um, yes, but it's, it's extremely um, dynamic. My, my thought is that my clients vary. And so my designs ought to vary. So um, I, I'm not of the... Um, the architecture style that has a specific design style that I give to all my clients. My my own is that what I do in my work is a response to my client's request or demand. So a client's request, because the clients vary, they may have very different requests and things like that. These I would attempt to give them my response. So I don't have a, a rigid style that I apply for all my clients. It's dependent on the client, and I often tell that uh, the success of my design is not the, my own thoughts. What is nice? It is what how well I've interpreted a client's request, and how that design goes to satisfy the client's uh, um, usage. Then I'll be able to say that this has been a successful architectural piece. So I don't have a rigid style. I try to be more in response to whatever my clients' demands may be. I put my touch to it, and then that becomes my solution for that particular um, project. So, Rainy has come back again with the clarity, with the clarity on her question. She is asking, okay, she gave a scenario. Mm-hmm. She was like, oh. <laughs> for instance, when a scheme or a project is given, I end up being stuck on how to design the scheme or find solutions to it. And also I end up being discouraged when I see others working and I'm having nothing. I just wanted to ask, how can I overcome such situations? Because sometimes I end up giving up. Okay. Rina, I like your honesty and the challenge that you discussed about. Um, how do you overcome it? Um, the thing is that some people are, are, are very quick with their initial ideas. Some people are late with their initial ideas. Uh, if seeing other people's scheme gives you discouragement, I would say that you really should kind of blind yourself to that and don't go around looking at other people's scheme because I mean, for me personally, I don't like the aspect of the discouragement. But um, you are in school, to be trained. Um, the reality is that the practice of architecture is going to be sometimes akin to what you go through school. Your clients are going to give you work to do, and there's very limited time, and they expect to see this is this Friday. And maybe Tuesday or Wednesday is coming up, and your designs have not 
jobs yet. What I encourage a lot of people to do is that I think that a lot of people await to be and then they sit down. My personal thinking is that design is ought to be like a lifestyle. It ought to be when you're bathing, when you're sleeping, when you're eating, when you're walking, you are thinking it. And when you do these things, the time you sit down to draw, your ideas would have been a little formulated. For example, let's say coming to meet you guys today in this creative university, I was not waiting till I finished all my rounds to sit down and then now I start thinking what is going to be the whole discussion while I'm driving, while I'm eating, while I'm talking, I'm thinking about what we're going to discuss. So I see a lot of people in school, they are now in your formative years as an architect and you probably go through a day where you are at lectures or you come in here and friends are talking, you go to eat, You've gone here, you've gone there, and then you think that in the evening, you go and sit at the studio and design. What I'm saying is that all through the day, when you are walking, when you are eating, when you start thinking the design, start planning what you want to do. So by the time you sit down to actually draw, some thoughts would have formulated in your mind already. So by the time you sit down, you're just pouring the thoughts that you already have. So um, that's what I'll be encouraging that you do to be able to get your ideas out of the Okay, so Harris is asking um, a question concerning jobs. That do you get stressed over your job? If so, how do you handle it? I I said to myself many years ago that I want to practice at the top of my profession. And at the top of the profession, there's pressure. So for me, um, I, not that I welcome pressure, but when there's pressure, I, I tell myself this is this is when you call yourself a top architect. So for example, when I'm watching football and then let's say a top player has to go and take a penalty, I say, Oh, this is the, the time that um, men rise to their call. You know? So um, architecture is big business. The thing is that people have saved all their lives and they are going to give it to you and me to design for them. They are not joking. They are not talking. This is not about a dress. This is not about uh, a shoe. This is architecture. It's people's whole life savings that they are going to entrust it to you to draw, to bring it to realization. So it comes with pressure. I mean, I will not lie to anybody who studied especially architecture and say that, oh, there's no pressure. There are other arts, there are other creative words. There's no pressure too. You can take your time, you can go and sit at the beach, and you can do your own painting the way you want. You can say, I want to go the weekend to sit here. You, you can create with your, in architecture, most of the time, people have commissioned you who want the design for a certain meeting. It's tight timelines. This is what in school the lecturers try to let you go through. It's tight timelines. And that's how the real world is. And that means pressure. I think that the thing for me that I want to advise most people about is that when we accept that this is pressure, you are able to deal with it. Too many of us go like, hey, this thing there, the pressure is too much. It's, this is the work, this is the profession you've chosen to go into. It comes with pressure. You face it. You realize that you're able to go through it. But when you are like, you know, this thing, this thing there, Charlie, this thing, then all that mentally, even weighs you down the more. Now, the way I have dealt with pressure, mostly, is to be well planned. So you are given a scheme. The submission is next week Friday. Today is Tuesday. You look at it, you work your plan from the completion day or the submission day to now. Okay, I need two days to do the rendering. Maybe I'll go and print it at this place here. I need another three days to do the model. I need this guy to work out the plan. So you work it out to, so today you can say, okay, today I'm not doing anything, this is it. I'm just going to have fun with my friends and laugh. Tomorrow morning by 6, I'm in the studio starting to work. 
when you don't have a plan or you are not well programmed, pressure becomes more on you. You get under a lot of stress. When you are well planned, you know that you have an action plan to the completion time. The pressure is not as crazy. So the thing I would advise is to work plan. Also, there are things that you should recognize you can do and cannot do when you have an assignment. There are certain things that you look at it, I want to do this, I want to do look at the time, these ones are not possible to do. Rule them out. Keep to what you think is doable in the time that you are given. How are you going to do it? Which machine are you using? Where are you printing? Which paper? And get all those logistics well planned. I think being well planned is one of the biggest remedies to pressure. And then mentally, tune yourself and tell yourself that this is it. I came to School of Architecture for this. If there is pressure, I have to do it. Others have walked this path, they have done it. I can do it too. It, it makes you well prepared and you're able to go through. When this, that mentality is there, you feel less pressure. When you don't have that mentality, it's as if you're the only one who's under so much, this one don't know how to, this one. People have done it. If you don't sleep the whole night, you won't die. Tomorrow after the submission, you go and sleep. Have that kind of mindset. So. Really, I mean, my staff and my mates from school, they will tell you, I mean, I've been through the pressures, but I don't buckle. I just tell myself, man's got to do what a man's got to do. I mean, so I face up to it and I go through it. That's it. It's peace. You can't run away from it. That's peace. So we have a question concerning monetization. It says, how do I monetize my legs? In this case, I think designs and like portfolios and everything. How do I monetize my work now? How do you monetize your business? So, how do you make some financial things yes, from your work? Yes, please. Hmm. That's interesting. I, I would say that um, if your work is sellable, so for example, one of the conversations I tend to have with a lot of students when they're about to do their final year thesis work is that make it a topic or a subject which industry has demand for. Sometimes people have done their thesis work, a lot of research work done, and it's not something which can be sold. So you need to look at relevant projects in town. And when you've worked on those kind of projects as your schoolwork, it's easy to take them to the powers that be to find a good monetary value for it. Because to say that it, something can be monetized also suggests that there's a demand for it. So it means that what you're doing, it ought to be something that the business world has a demand for. If they don't have a demand for it, then it can do work, it can be so beautiful, but it cannot be monetized. Monetize means people want to pay money for it. So choose the topics that you do as well very carefully make it relevant things to the industry or to the to the economy and then you find people ready to pay for it okay. and the last question so far last but one question so far is this what is the future of architecture in ghana i think it's beautiful i think it's bright I have a saying that I, I tell that uh, our cities haven't been built yet. I mean, if you go to uh, cities like New York, like Dubai, like like uh, London, people are still building. And, and these cities, they don't find any empty spaces easily. And people are still building. Now, when you look around at our terminal commerce, I mean, more than half the city is actually empty. And we have so many other buildings which have remained uncompleted for decades, which have lost its relevance and needs to be break down or pulled down and things like that. There are a lot more buildings which are built in the 40s, the 50s, the 60s, which is now dilapidated and moved to the radar. I think the future of architecture is very bright. I mean, it's a good time to be a Ghanaian architect, it's a good time to be an architect. A lot of our cities are now going to be built. 
We don't have our monuments and things in place. We don't have our parks. We don't have our tourist sites in place. These are all yet to be created. And it's something begging to be done. We should just all pray for that we experience a stable government, we experience good economic growth because somehow construction industry uh, thrives on these things. When people are in the states where there is war, or people are in the states where we cannot even afford food to eat, they will not build. They don't want parks, they don't want gardens, they don't want tall buildings. They want to eat, they want to be able to pay for school fees and pay for their medicine, etc. So it's when all of these things have been done, though, people start to now look at their own. But I think that the future of architecture in Ghana is truly bright. There's so much more to be done. And, and we should pray for stability and all of these things will come. Okay. So there's a question, very interesting one from Edim. He's asking, do you please care to share with us one of your designs and highlight some elements that, that express various sense of creativity? Okay, let's let's take that question again. But unfortunately, unfortunately, we won't be able to share these designs. Okay, so I mean, I don't mind to do uh, what can uh, put together like a gallery of our office where we can look at them. Um, I wouldn't mind if at another forum. So I, I don't mind to share a gallery of uh, works we can and things so, uh, with you. Maybe at another time I can take a abstract design and then stick us to it. So to our audience, these designs would be coming soon. Yes, please. Well, I'm sure that in the next few minutes we'll say. So in the next few minutes we'll have the designs displayed to you. But uh, our website as well as uh, yeah. mm-hmm. A bit of the bit of the bit of the Okay, so the website is being typed into the okay. Atelier SM. So the website is being typed into the chat box www.ateliersmq.com. So even though we are coming to share a gallery of the designs, you can see more and even insights on that website. Thank you very much. So in the meantime, you can... In the meantime, let me speak briefly on Creative University. So, Creative University is a training hub and organization where we raise people into creativity. So we raise and nurture creativity out of them. So that these creative skills that we give unto you, you can realize the, the, the value in it and make it high income skills. These high income skills are skills that are really, really in demand. They are really, really much in serious demand in the market. So we have things like programming, we have things like drawing, all those things are high income skills where the market desires people who have them. And now in this modern world, these skills are hidden behind applications. So let's take architecture, for example. Architecture, some skills are hidden behind some applications like Revit, SketchUp, Lumion, and all those others. Corona Render, 3DS Max, all those others. So now with Creative University, we organize master classes where we teach these applications so that you develop these various skills. Aside those applications, we also teach 3D modeling. So with Blender, with Cinema 4D, and with all the other applications. So again, we thank you very much for joining the first session for today. As I said, we are preparing the gallery to share so that he can speak concerning the designs. So we can also answer Adam's question. But again, I really, really thank you all for joining in today. Tomorrow.
tomorrow is going to be a very wonderful session with the honorary secretary of Ghana Institute of Architects. Today we spoke with the president of the Ghana Institute of Architects. Tomorrow is going to be very exciting. So I advise that you prepare your questions, prepare them so much so that when the speaker enters, you already have your questions premeditated and prepared. So he addresses all your questions and all your needs. So thank you very much again for your time. So we are waiting for the, the gallery and the designs and he speaks on them and we close. Thank you again for your time. So kindly give us a minute or two. Thank you again. Okay, and we are back with the designs. So architect SM Corte is going to take us through some of the designs and share some tips and his ideas on it. Right. Thank you very much, Papa. Um, okay, so take us more to the scheme. Okay, so this is the National Communications Authority Head Office at Airport City in Accra. Um, this was a national competition that Atelier won. The original winning scheme was a twin tower design, but eventually for political reasons that wasn't built, but uh, this is what was built. For me, in this scheme here, we're trying to be uh, compliant with the corporate colors of NCA, which was the blue. We're trying to create a building which has kind of wavy to it. We thought that uh, communication by way of uh, signals and how it's, it works, it moves like kind of sound and then waves. So these are things that we try to replicate on the building's elevation of a side. These are still views of the National Communication uh, Head Office at Airport City, Accra. This is a um, thing that we did for Sunyani. Oh, okay, this is Osu Barclays. Um, it was an existing building that we had to remodel. Uh, Barclays was to move from its location to another location on High Street Osu. You know, we created this for them. So this is also Barclays office. This is another national competition that we won. It's a 12-story building for Calban, their head office. Uh, what we did at that time, the Calban's logo was an Edinburgh symbol uh, in Sa, as we've seen here. We tried to help the logo of their clients um, used on the innovation. So this was also a really scheme in the competition that we participated in Cal Bank Head Office on Independence Avenue. That's the Cal Bank Head Office. One of the things that I choose to, um, I think that we must take note is that I found out that um, for tall builders, it has neither a front nor a back. And um, because of the way the building height is, it's going to rise above this neighboring building. So when you're an architect and you have to design a tall building, you need to be very sensitive to all the facades. Not that you say, oh, I'm doing the front so exciting. The back will still be exposed. So it's something that you need to work on. And lighting in our time is another thing that we need to work on very well because the building has to be so illuminated. There are times when we use to fluorescent lights on buildings to light it, it's gone. Now we need to understand lighting. We need to let the building glow at night. So uh, it's good to be thinking about um, lighting of your building when um, it's nighttime. This is Una Home. It's one of my um, early projects that brought my business or my practice into light. Um, I had these clients who had seen something I've done for Sunder Chartered Bank. I was still working for my previous employers and then they came to me and said, can you do this building at Airport City? At that time, Airport City was pretty new. Hardly any buildings had been built there. And it's a project that I'm very happy and proud of. It brought me quite a lot of um, publicity. No, this is still now. One of the things I did at Una Home is that on the main street opposite the airport area, again, I thought that cars are moving in that direction. And it was one of the early times that I tried to use waves in terms of a curved glass facade 
and people thought that it was very crazy. Then when we had finished the building, the top of it, I realized that a lift headroom had to be at the top. And the lift headroom looked very funny. So I put this, I call like a crown at the top of it. And that is where I put the signage. For architects, we must be very sensitive about where signage is, or how we put it on the building. Because when you finish a building, it needs to be named, it needs to be known. And when you're putting the signage, it needs to be thought about and incorporated into your design. At the top of it, for me, I said that if something is beautiful, if you win something, they put a crown on you. So I tried to put this um, circular crown, which is also what was carrying the signage. Um, this is more recent. It's Allied Oil. <clears throat> they are new corporate head office at um, Abelempe. I mean, this wasn't a very easy project. The client wants some waves, but wants it to be very subtle. Once the creates key, it stands for uh, this whole corporate and strong identity. So this is at Abelempe, Allied Oil's head office. These are still um, pictures or images of the same building. This we did for a client at um, airport area residential. It's called the Elizabeth. And um, the client wanted a lot of drama to do with the building. Sometimes the truth is that some of these forms that we do, it's not everything that ought to be functional. Like this kind of column that we have standing there. At the time when the clients moved in and then the tenants and everybody wanted to be there. The client said, all oh, this space we could have done, office space and you could have attracted more went out to it, but we do them that, um, for want of a better description, I think that, I don't know whether people will use the term for shady reasons. <laughs> <laughs> so, some, a few of the things like some kind of a curve going in there, but my concept here was kind of, uh, it was a rectangular building that I threw in the quadrants and curves that seemed to be extruded from the rectangle and it creates a, a bit of a drama to it. So sometimes these are the things that we do that pays the attention. The building, the client wanted it to be used. In fact, this particular project here, uh, one client came into town from Bamako. He was so in love with it. Eventually, we ended up putting another four or so projects in Bamako because the client loved this. This was the competition winner as well. They called it the Giazio Day. Independent Avenue uh, project. It was another national competition. It was a mixed commercial residential building that we won at um, Independence Avenue. Unfortunately, to date, though, it hasn't been built. But um, I, I, I say that it was an interesting scheme. It was purely a, a rectangular block of apartments when we did the design, and it looked kind of ordinary. And uh, Barry, can you is it possible to zoom in to see this a little bit? Uh, right, so I remember, right, I remember the one we did the original design was looking a bit too plain as a rectangle. And then there was a song that I, I was listening to one day, it says that if if you if you love her, put a ring on her or something like that. So I was like, okay, let me put a ring on this building. And so we put this ring on it. And suddenly it looked very different. It looked an award winning scheme. And so it was purely simple rectangular street building. And just by putting the ring on it, just brought all the drama to it. Again, it was an award uh, winning project, but it hasn't been built um, to date. Still. So, these are still the same. It has an overhead swimming pool. And things like that. Okay, this is also a skill we did for a client. It hasn't been built yet. But, um, it's the song that we're hoping that it gets built soon. Because of it. This the client went on to build something a bit similar, but they didn't use our scheme. There's also a commercial building. I wish that maybe maybe next time when I get the opportunity, I'll showcase more of residential. Interesting as an architect, my one of my favorite parts of architecture is residentials. But uh, I think that this for purpose of today's presentation is more of commercial projects that we're showing. This icon is also supposed to be a country. We're hoping that next year it's going to be built. Restaurant and spa. Put me back. I just love the Right. Okay. So um, the client wanted a glass building, but what we tried to do was that even though it has a glass facade, we tried to.
create these kind of contours or curved things from it. it. It kind of just gives it a different thing. So what we've tried to do is that, um, yes, we'll do things that would add a bit of a flavor to it that just gives us our own little touch. So this is the pool area, for example, just the canopy and then you put a touch on it, just this a different feel completely from how others may look at it. With the bars to sitting in the water like that from the bar area. The signature is supposed to be at industrial area at, um, in Accra. So this is, it has kind of restaurants and things on the ground floor, has offices and then a penthouse at the top. This is almost completed at uh, that's a beautiful sheet. It's a head office for some clients of ours. You can zoom into this one. So, for example, in this one, it's a pretty, it's not so like a regular, unusual facade. Should, well, but I mean, some of these verticals just give some strong presence to the office. So, this is an IT firm their head office in uh, a building bin in order to create something unique and different. But just these three things there gives it some kind of strength to the whole facade. Okay, these are some offices that yeah, those were some clients. Yeah. This is a fitness, like a gym that we did in an office space at um, Airport City. It's been constructed, it's been completed, it's in the news as we speak. Still the gym. Uh, yeah, some proposals for the franchise office. Okay. Yes, please. So amazing and out of this world designs from an amazing and out of this world speaker, architect SM Koti. Mm -hmm. Such a wonderful time we have had today. And there's more in store for you tomorrow. Thank you again for your time and I'd like to see you tomorrow. Good night. Mm -hmm.